Well, good morning, everybody. I'm John. How's everybody's DrupalCon going? Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I've been learning a ton all week. I really enjoyed it, and particularly learning about things I didn't even know exist. It, so, you know, connecting with other people doing similar projects. Um, there's, it sounds like a lot of us trying to solve some of the same problems of how to connect uh, front end to Drupal and, uh, and get the, the best developer experience out of it, make it easy to do. So I um, thought I'd share the story of uh, how we are solving this problem at, uh, at my company, Freelock right now. So um, what we are, it's interesting, my slides are not in sync here. Uh, let me try refreshing. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's see, will it, will it get there? So um, what we're going to cover today is basically a little bit about you know, what is progressive enhancement, why would you choose this over fully headless uh, or just straight Drupal, uh, some examples of things that we've done, and then we're going to get into the, a little bit of the weeds of how do you actually hook this up and do it. Um, so you know, I, I'm was setting out some goals. They asked in the speaker proposal, what are you trying to learn? This is what I'm trying to kind of get across is just a, a couple of techniques for developers to get started putting a Vue application on top of Drupal. And this doesn't have to be Vue. There's lots of other ways of doing it. We're using Vue as an example because that's the platform we've chosen and what we're, what we're going uh, with. So first question is why? Why are we doing progressive enhancements instead of fully decoupled? And there's, you know, there's quite a few different ways of looking at this. I mean, first of all, you know, Drupal is great for the, what it was and what it's been for the last 15 years. And it's got some really powerful technology under the hood, the ability to extend and do all sorts of things beyond just content management systems. We're doing a lot of uh, event registrations, uh, membership sites, uh, a bunch of interactive things that, uh, that is just a really nice, you know, there's a lot of support, a lot of code, a lot of best practices available for. Um, but we're not really all that comfortable using JavaScript as Drupal developers. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a, a new technology area. Uh, on the other hand, single page apps uh, or decoupled headless apps, those end up having two completely separate sites. You have a front end and a back end, and um, and so you've got a lot of uh, a lot of things that you can do to really have a nice user experience, and that's the main reason that uh, you know it's kind of a little bit more of a. It's no longer the WordPress versus Drupal. It's it's the back end sites versus the front end sites. Uh, and front end, you know, we've got Vue, we've got React, we've got Angular that are all just really able to deliver whole new classes of user experience that you just can't do if you just have a page at a time coming back and forth. But you lose all the stuff that you get from Drupal. You lose a lot of the, you know, you have to figure out all the answers around accessibility, around um, multilingual, around, you know, you name it, there's problems that Drupal has solved that you have to solve all over again when you go headless. Um, and so, and it makes it really expensive and hard to change for clients. So we're working with the smaller end of the market, you know, a lot of nonprofits, they just don't have the budget to do fully decoupled, but they'd like some of the user experience uh, benefits of it. So that's what, where we find this area in the middle of progressive enhancements. And this is basically taking a normal Drupal site, Drupal theme, and adding some of the, the UX richness and improvements that you get from headless uh, applications and frameworks and putting, embedding them in Drupal. And so it's individual widgets, might be entire sections of a site, a variety of, of things there. You do get a lot, a lot, a lot of it is similar to doing headless. You've got to figure out how to connect the data to the back end, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, later in the talk. Um, but it's, we find it to be a really nice place to, to be developing, especially with a lot of existing sites that are already on Drupal and being able to add functionality and really improve them. 
Um, so going back into a little bit of how we frame the history of JavaScript, uh, when we started here, uh, there were some early toolkits, uh, the jQuery, Dojo, UE, you know, jQuery went into Drupal core early on. And these are just, uh, there are things to help you do consistently across browsers. It helps sort out some of the cross browser issues, but they didn't do a whole lot for you. Uh, browsers have gotten a whole lot better. Uh, and do a lot more of this for you. We're, we're calling generation two, you know, Dojo is one of the early ones uh, and they've done, they did a lot to kind of establish some patterns. It was always kind of a library that not many people used. How many people here are, use Dojo out of curiosity? Nobody, okay. <laughs> we, uh, we, we used it quite a bit early on uh, before even coming to Drupal. So this is something that we had, had been in. And, and they built kind of a store pattern back in like 2005 uh, that are very similar to stores in the modern frameworks. But it didn't get much adoption and most of the people uh, moved on to other things. In fact, uh, one of the, the, the actually the, the originator of the project um, is, actually went to Google and first made the, embed the Chrome browser in IE plugin that <laughs> we all used to use. And then um, he, he has really been one of the instigators of the web component spec. So, you know, Dojo is actually running through a lot of this in the history. Um, current, this is what I call the current generation, React, Vue.js, Angular, you know, the, the, the first generation of Angular was completely rewritten. It's now, you know, these are all reactive. So it, this has taken that store concept of having a client-side data store uh, and made it so you don't have to do the wiring up to, with the UX. You just change the data in the store and the UX updates automatically, which is so nice as a developer to just uh, to be able to work with. And what I'm calling the next generation are web components primarily. I mean, web components have been around a, lot, a while, but we're not actually using them. Um, I went to that talk on outline earlier this week and, and I, I think it's really exciting. I definitely think this is where things are going. And Svelte is, um, is a, uh, another framework that I've been looking at a lot that is, avoids the shadow DOM as a whole and, and is a lot closer to, to web components. So both of these I think are, are really interesting. So just sort of setting the, the background. So why did we choose Vue.js? It's these things, it's easy to learn, it looks like HTML, it's declarative. Uh, we're generally trying to stay away from the front runners in the market because often we find that there's over, they're overhyped and, uh, and, and there's better quality solutions down the stack. That's not to throw shade on anything. I think React is a great framework and obviously there's tons of people using it and it, they all do the same thing. So there's. This is really an arbitrary choice, like so much in technology. Um, but it's the one we chose, and we've been really happy with it. We've been using it on a bunch of projects, so, um, so that's what we're going into. So switching gears a little bit, you know, what should you be enhancing? What are some examples of things that, that you might do? Um, we've actually done quite a few uh, things. This is a, a partial list, um, but they're generally interactive components of one sort or another that, uh, that we're just sort of plugging in smart widgets and building. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a variety of these. They're just, you know, end up being components that can drop onto a web page. Uh, and, and what we're going to show in a little bit is how to actually get started with some of these, is something along these lines. Um, so here's a couple of examples in a little bit more detail. Uh, this is a project for a, a, an NGO called Better Care Network, and they are a library of 11,000 documents at this point. I mean, it's growing like dozens of documents a week. Uh, it's a, very interested in child welfare around the world. And so they have, uh, they have done a lot to kind of share practices across a wide variety of organizations and communities and, and methodologies and how to improve uh, this, the situation. And they had a really complex model for how to actually engage with all of the, um, the content they have on the site. And so we worked with a design firm to come up with what we call the puzzle project. 
and it basically helps people get a mental map in their head of the various areas of practice uh, in a very dynamic, animated way of, uh, of letting you drill down to the actual content that you're looking for uh, and see the relationships with other content. So in their vast library, they've got a really easy way to, uh, to get a handle on it. We built this using taxonomy as the prime, uh, the prime back end. So these, each one of these screens that you're looking at is essentially a taxonomy term, and it's a nested hierarchical taxonomy. So at the top level was the ring, and then you drill down into these, these areas. And the, the client can edit everything on this page just on the taxonomy term page <coughs> using a normal Drupal, Drupal form. Uh, change the color, change the background image. Uh, it, we've made it so that they can have up to 11 pieces. It just automatically gives them a shape that fits the, the pieces in there. And, and, um, and then we matched up the routes. So each of these taxonomy term pages, we have a, a use path auto to create a nice path using the hierarchy. And we used View Router to sync those up. So we got both the search engine benefit when the search engines crawl the same URLs you visit. They can bookmark one of these, send it to somebody, and load it up. Uh, another example is we're working with uh, a company now that has kind of a sophisticated data model. And is the animation actually going to run here? Um, and this is basically for the insurance industry, and they needed uh, to provide instructions for the users to pick the right insurance company out of this mess of hierarchy uh, and trying to you know, find the, the right one. They needed, so they needed the description associated with each taxonomy term, and so we built a quick little widget that just shows that. Uh, and then it also had different rules about walking this taxonomy t to children, parents. We love using taxonomy for, it seems like we've settled on that as a solution for a lot of things, just for the hierarchy. Um, and then, uh, all right, I lost my sink here. All right, what is going on? There we go. Um, and then we have an internal tool where we're using this for project management. And in this, we are able to kind of track tasks, uh, open up a different uh, modal windows to edit things, um, sort and, and edit and drag and drop, and we're doing a variety of things, just sort of building dashboards that bring lots of, uh, lots of pieces together. Uh, we're actually in the midst of another one of these for a client that does accessibility work with the uh, buildings. So they do ADA compliance, not like we're used to on the web, but are there ramps on the entrances of the building? Are is the, the, the heights for the light switches and the colors and all that? And so they've got a big survey that they want to take out into the field and have an iPad and just sort of put their notes in for the, the barriers to various compliance issues. And they want to have all the right context because it's you know the project, the building, the floor, the room. They need to be able to add and manage all this, this tree of information and make sure they're adding to the right, right one so that it ends up in the final report. So a few things not to build. Um, we really always start with the user experience. So we're always thinking about our editors and authors as the, the user of this. And uh, a lot of times it's, you know, the, the problem with going fully headless is if they need to change something, they have to come in and get a developer. But if we can build in the experience and so they can just edit it and do all the stuff they need, it, they love it. It's a really great way to go. Um, and so the, 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 the other thing about it is, you know, when you're going headless, if you're doing something that, that is going to change over time, and how many people have a website that doesn't change over time? <laughs> All our clients. We have one client that we just picked up that is fully headless now, and they haven't updated their site, so it's on Drupal 8.3 and they can't make the changes they want to make because they don't have developer support. So they've found us, and we're going to be redoing their build pipeline so that we can actually do all that sort of stuff. Um, 
All right, so let's get into some code. Uh, that's kind of the overview here. Uh, so we're gonna spend a little time on just sort of how to get a view widget loading in Drupal, um, how to use JSON API for accessing data, uh, and, and spend a little bit of time in that. Just gonna touch on routes a little bit, but primarily it's the, the first couple here. So first off, loading view in Drupal. Um, these are the steps, and it's really straightforward. Uh, once you've done it a couple of times, it's like five minutes. So first of all, it's uh, create a module, and we love using Drush, so here's a, an abridged example of using Drush to generate a new module. And uh, step through and, and answer your questions. Uh, when you're done, you end up with a uh, a Drupal module in there, you can enable it again with Drush, and, and there you go. You now have the, the container for your code. So next, if you're doing a block, this is a simple block. You can uh, generate a block with Drush as well. Uh, very simple framework and plugin. Most of you should be familiar with this. We also do field formatters or field widgets quite often. So. Um, there's other ways, but anything that'll take a render array will use this pattern. Uh, this is just your, your stock uh, setup for it. Place it on a page, all normal Drupal stuff. So everybody in this room hopefully ha is comfortable with this. View, so this is similar. Uh, there's a great project called View CLI, which is a, a way to bootstrap a whole View project, similar to the React Create app. Um, you need Node.js on your computer. With that, it's pretty straightforward. Install Vue CLI, uh, change into your module directory. So we like to bundle it with our module, or if we're doing it in a theme, we'll put it in a, a subdirectory of the theme. So when we, so basically we start in the theme directory, run this command, and then it will generate the, the base Vue framework here. And, and so there's the, the part that is Vue, that's nested inside our block, and there's the, our custom Drupal block uh, in terms of the code. So that's the skeleton framework. Uh, next thing is to make them talk to each other. And so, uh, so there's several parts to this. Not many, it's, not, it's pretty quick. These are the things we need to do with Vue, and we'll go through each of these. And then on the Drupal side, it's, it's getting the, the JavaScript hooked up. So first in Vue, uh, we create a build target. So this is something that we've done a bunch of different ways, and this is the solution we've ended up with. Vue has a built-in support for a JavaScript library called .env, .env. And this lets you have uh, both a .env that gets read automatically with environment variables, and you can have a different one that's a env, .env development that's only run when you do your local development builds in, uh, in Vue. And so we declare basically the, uh, the, the endpoint and the assets directory through that, uh, and so basically it's a view config JS is these are this is a place where you can override the default uh, behavior of the view build. And when you use create a project, this file doesn't exist, so you have to create this file, drop in a few lines of code, uh, and then in the package JSON, we will add a Drupal as a build target. And this is just the pattern we've adopted that moves the build, when you run this, it moves the, the built uh, JavaScript outside the view project and into the Drupal project. We also turn off file name hashing because by default, most uh, front end um, projects will add a hash to the file, very much like uh, aggregated CSS or JavaScript in Drupal. Um, that makes it hard to load that in Drupal, so we end up turning that off so that we don't have to change our libraries file every time we, we rebuild. Um, and then there's the, the rest of the context around it. And then npm run Drupal, after defining that, will um, we'll build your project for production and drop it into the, the assets directory. So next is the Drupal side. 
so now that uh, view is, is built, it, they're now in assets, and the index HTML will show you where the script and CSS files are. Um, th that index, uh, index HTML is a single line, so it helps to have something to pretty print it so you can read, read it easier and find the exact names of your bundle and job, of the JavaScript and the CSS. And those are the things that you're going to put in your library's YAML for Drupal to load. And so um, that's basically it. The, the other parts are preloading. Uh, we haven't really delved that far into performance improvements and best practices around that. We figure that let's get the files into JavaScript, load them up, and we'll do the optimization on the Drupal side when the time comes. Uh, and if you do add stuff to view or split your project out into layers, this will change, so you may need to come back and update your library's file. So, and then finally, the last thing is getting your DOM element in your, uh, in your project, or in your render array. In this case, it's targeting uh, uh, the, the stock uh, ID of app, and it renders on your page. Uh, and that's basically it. That's all, all you need to do to get view loaded. And from then on, you're, you can develop straight in view, and, uh, and you don't really need to do much more in Drupal aside from enabling JSON API and the next section. So, uh, so next we're gonna go into how to actually get data in and out of uh, Drupal to view. Uh, and there's a lot of complications in this, and there's uh, a bunch of different solutions, and I've been talking to people here about different alternatives. This is what we're currently doing as kind of our, our example, and so I, we've built a couple of libraries to sort of help with this. Um, so here's the, the first part. This part of the problem is if you're doing something more complex in Vue, it's just too slow to NPM run Drupal, clear the cache, wait for everything. Front-end developers are impatient. <laughs> they want to see the, the example right away. So, um, so what we're going to talk about now is how do you get it so that you can access data as an authenticated user uh, when you are in a headless environment. So setting up that headless environment so you can be at localhost accessing your data and, um, and access it as an authenticated user so that you can see everything you need to see as you're developing. Uh, and so there's, uh, there's, a f and there's another complication is the, the deployment of this. After you've built your code, uh, some of our early projects, we ended up, before we figured out the environment variables trick, we were hard coding in an absolute URL into our config file that we'd built. And then that always pointed at production, and you couldn't really test changes in Drupal uh, because you know if something actually broke your Drupal site before you released it, you didn't know because you weren't actually looking at it. Uh, so having that environment variables set for your endpoints in your .env file just works beautifully. It solves this problem really in a nice way. Um, so the .env development, you can, you can add your dev site uh, address right there, and, uh, and then you can you run that on localhost. So, um, so that's, yeah, that's, a, that's the, one of the key tricks. The next thing is uh, the, uh, the actual authentication bit. Um, and I was actually just, I, I ended up writing this library just a couple of weeks ago because we were, uh, I was trying to get other developers uh, able to be productive on, on the accessibility site that we were doing. And basically this is meant more for development than anything. And basically it's a, it le leverages Axios, which is a JavaScript request library. And it uses interceptors to inject the headers that you need for either OAuth authentication or uh, the CSERF token, the cross-site request forgery. If you're going to write data back to the server as a, using a session token, it, you know, which you can do if you are embedded in a Drupal site, you have the Drupal session and you can read the data as whoever you're logged into the main Drupal site with. But when you go to post it back, uh, there, there's a Basically, it, it will deny you unless you pass a CSERF token. And so this will just handle it for you uh, if OAuth isn't configured. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day, Brad, I think I mentioned that there's a core bug around that so you can actually turn that off, turn off the requirement to do the CSERF token. Um, so 
This may not be as necessary going forward, but even right now, this is one of the issues that you would hit, uh, and that's one of the reasons we did this. So basically, you drop this in. You will need to pass it a pass. Uh, you will need to set up simple OAuth uh, or some sort of OAuth flavor and drop in environment variables to configure it uh, to actually use OAuth. That's a fairly quick thing to do, but it's another whole talk. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex topic. Um, but once you have your, your consumer application in there, you can just specify the UUID and an environment file. This will pick it up and inject your token. Uh, and that's just using the simple uh, client authentication flow in, in OAuth, which means that you need to provide username and password. Um, Vuex. So, how many people use Vue or Vuex? Okay, so Vue, Vuex, a lot fewer. Okay, it's a reasonable amount using Vue. So, Vuex is a state management system that's built for Vue. Uh, the modern JavaScript uh, has a whole bunch of different libraries, and you can kind of pick and choose the ones you want. So, it's, there's other ways to go, but we've found Vuex to be really useful. Uh, we found a Vuex uh, library called Reststate Vuex that is built for JSON API, and when we found it, it was already marked abandoned. <laughs> so we we forked it and basically made some changes to make it work easier with Drupal, particularly around uh, when you are talking to a JSON API server on Drupal. The endpoints will be entity type slash bundle, and but the the type you get back is any type dash dash bundle. And this translates back and forth for you automatically. So you just pull it in and you can register the endpoints that you want to access in the, uh, as view, view X sub modules. So that's aside from the, the imports, that's the entire uh, view X store to get started. And then uh, on the, the right side, uh, let's see, which side did I do this? Yeah, so the right side is your component, is an example of a component mounting it uh, and, uh, and loading, it, uh, loading the data and, and rendering it. Um, the render template would look like this. And in view, you can have single file components. So the, the, all three of these last chunks are in a single .view file, template, script, and, uh, and you can have styles as well. So uh, I kind of split out the, the scripts here so you could see the, the, the important parts. So what you end up with with the, the REST state client is uh, you basically just, we, we registered it in the, in the store here, uh, uh, node dash dash article. Uh, when the, the component is mounted, we issue a call to fetch the data. And so the, this, this module will fetch it, store it in Vuex, um, and you can always call a load again. There's a variety of load methods. You can load by properties. You can load uh, by ID. You can load in a bunch of different ways. It'll keep it there in Vuex. And then um, the other thing that we're doing here is there's a bunch of options in the JSON API uh, for Drupal for including related objects and uh, picking which fields to load for each content type. And the way we handle that is we just sort of put it in our store so that we, we can access the same set from all of our components. Uh, and then we just attach that as uh, an argument when we load the data or, or get a particular object. So th this, this library basically has those two basic steps. There's a load step and a get. And, uh, and there's parallel methods for each one. Uh, and if it's already in the store, you don't need to load it. So what you end up with in the data binding side, uh, we've got a, 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 a method for wrapping the tags and articles. And this is literally all the code that's needed to get a list of all your articles showing on a, on a site. So it's fairly straightforward to work with. Um, it also supports writing back. Uh, you do need to kind of sort out uh, a lot of the, the issues around, um, you know, what we tend to do is make a copy of the, uh, the article in this case and flatten it so that we don't have the attributes to, to 
iterate through. Uh, and then we'll have, um, we'll respond to changes that the user puts in the interface with, uh, with the watch and uh, update our, uh, update a, a, a fresh copy of the object and then just put it back in the store. And there's a method for doing that. There's there two. So this is all really straightforward, easy for both read, write, create. Um, so view router uh, aren't going as much into it, but it's definitely really useful if your object ha it needs to be aware of the page that it's on. Uh, and so we use this a lot to kind of sync up and know which objects to get on a particular page, and that way you can have a button that is aware of what it is. Uh, you can also um, embed in your DOM element properties and treat it more like a web component and, and pass those straight into your, uh, your components. Um, path auto you know, and routing is, uh, is something we really pay a lot of attention to. Already told you how we like taxonomy term trees. Um, Another thing, another best practice that we've found is we will keep, uh, when you create, pull in other interface projects, you'll end up with uh, different folders to put your components in. Everything's, pretty much everything's a component. We tend to use views, uh, use the views directory to put anything that's linked to a route, and those tend to be more layout related components, and then all the data binding ones uh, are end up in the components directory. Um, and just some tips for organization will help you in, uh, in the long run. Another one that I recently was reading as a best practice is never use single word uh, names for your components. Uh, always have multiple words to give it more context. It's a list, it's a view, it's, a, it's a, an item or whatever uh, as you're doing it. Um, this is just scratching the surface. Uh, we've looked at decoupled menus, and that kind of comes underneath the, the, uh, the JSON API endpoints. You can load a menu and get a link set back, and, um, and we played around with that a little bit. And there's I've been a lot of talk here about it, so it's exciting to see that progressing. Uh, the PWA talk uh, yesterday, well, I found really interesting, and uh, and and this, you know, this is kind of ready to go to bundle up and and add your web workers into your view project and, and just keep going. View CLI does a bit more than just uh, the command line; it has a UI on top of it. If you just type view UI, it'll open up in a web browser, and it remembers the projects on your computer, and you can go and add other. Other, it's like a package manager for Vue, uh, pull in a, a whole variety of related projects. We, we tend to use Beautify a lot as a UI toolkit, and that has a lot of uh, things like tab controls and accordions and, uh, and a lot of really nice form elements, uh, so we'll base things on that. Um, code splitting and layers, uh, it's, that's another thing that we've figured out how to do is you can have multiple top level components and in the main JS that bootstraps it, you can split those out into different routes. And view router will also help you do the layer splitting so that you end up with just the layers you need for the components you're loading on the page. Uh, mul that's multiple entry points as well. Then you can uh, add those in various, uh, various spots in the page. View 3 has added a teleport as well so that you can basically take a particular component and bind it to a DOM element that's completely outside the main one. So you can have one app and s shoot your components off to different parts of the page that aren't just in the, the main thing. I haven't had a chance to, to try it out yet, um, but that's, uh, that's, that's another thing that's kind of on our radar. Uh, I've got some uh, links here. You can actually download the presentation. Uh, I've got a PDF version or a single page app version, uh, and I think I had that URL on the, the second slide, but it's freelock.com slash uh, uh, PVD, I think. Um, and then, so the, the NPM packages, there's a simple OAuth is useful for development. The API documentation for Drupal is a really great starting point. point. There's a lot of examples in what you need to use there. And, and 
Vue UX is, a, is another great place to start. And I should be adding a bunch more from this week because there's a lot of other great resources here too. And that's basically it. Uh, so at this point, um, take some questions. So I do have a, a live example that I just uh, put over on the Umami uh, in starter package if anybody wants to see it. But at this point, I'll open it up for questions. Yes. No, we're not doing, uh, the question is, uh, are, is there hot module loading inside Drupal or just an outside development environment? And um, no, we're not doing any in Drupal right now. We're just using the stock view uh, setup. So NPM run serve and uh, your widget loads up. Uh, and that's why we've kind of split the, the targets for environments so we can get at the Drupal data and just work on the component standalone. Yes. This is the obligatory SEO question, but in your terms of examples of listing out articles, um, what if you were leaning a little more heavily on this on view as kind of a component on top of the dynamic content? How do you temper the front end flexibility of view and also challenge for SEO? Yeah, so the question's on SEO and whether, how do you make sure that you get the content on the page for SEO when you have it all wrapped in a view widget. And we make heavy use of slots. So we will inject on the DOM of the page. You can insert uh, other HTML inside it. And so we end up having Drupal render the content for the search engine. And then we have it linked to the routes in, um, in view. And so it can either just take that content as is uh, and and render it uh, using view components, um, or if it needs to pull in other stuff. I mean, we we just basically make sure that all the searchable content is on the page with JavaScript turned entirely off, and we make the the routes match between Drupal and View so that if you if you go to one of those inside pages on our puzzle, for example, uh, you'll see all the text on the page in the in the source code. But it immediately bootstraps view and um, and loads its content uh, and some of the related links and all that, but all the images uh, and it's on the the page that you the same page that that Drupal is serving essentially in there. Yes. So I was at a BOF yesterday. I haven't done any of that. We've, we're using Drupal to render all, the, all the, the content that we want for search engines and everything. Uh, Drupal Next, though, I was talking to, it sounds like is working pretty well for that, doing the server-side rendering automatically. And it seems like there's a couple other uh, things out there as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and Druxt, I think, is the other the other one that's uh, that's going down that path. Okay. Yes. So. Generic Drupal web components is the is the answer, <laughs> or at least one of the answers. Uh, yeah, and I attended Brian's talk earlier, and it's a uh, great to hear. You know, we're trying to get as a community some standards going so that everybody doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. We can all work together and make uh, 
like like everything in Drupal, make one really good solution <laughs> that works for everybody. And any other questions? Do you want to see more code and take a look at any of that? Or are we, uh, I can pull up some stuff and, we, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, so that'd be for the initial page load, but if you're actually in your browser, you're not doing more page loads, you, you transition to the new route and it backfills just the data. So, um, and that way you can animate between your routes and do a bunch of really nice UX on that. Um, yeah, if, if you were actually going page to page, you, that would not be pretty. <laughs> yes. I didn't catch all of that authentication using simple OAuth and yeah, um, the simple OAuth side or the Vuex, all of it. So yeah, so what we did, and I, I like I said, I just I, I don't know if I can really get the demo here, but uh, basically it's install a simple OAuth module, uh, and then create a. Uh, uh, create your private and public key. You'll need to set that up and then add a consumer. Yeah, let me see if I can pull up my uh, IDE here. So can I switch this to mirror? Okay. Thank you all for coming. I'll keep on answering questions for everybody. <laughs>